Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick and I'm talking with Mark Gibson, who is, long intro this, Mark, sorry about it, co-chair application committee MEF, that's one hat, mm -hmm. and the other hat, you're director of product management Amdocs OSS at Amdocs. That's correct, yeah. Good. Well, welcome. Thank I'm you. I'm going to cover both sides of what you do, uh, work-wise at least. Uh, starting with this, what is zero-touch automation? I think zero-touch automation it sort of depends who you are and who you talk to is where you kind of see it. But at the very heart of it is the aim to, to kind of take human interaction out of day-to-day -day network operations to make that as automated as possible. So really it's, a, it's, it's a, I suppose, a recalibration of what used to be called automation, but you know, given a, um, a, a new title and probably a new focus as well. I'm going to talk to you about the focus because I've been in this industry a long time and mm. 20 years ago the talk was all of automation. And now it's come round again, isn't it? Yes. But it's a different iteration this time. Much more, what? Much more technologically focused. Or? I think it's. I think it's come about because of the uh, the launch of NFV. So when NFV was launched, there was this kind of great belief that you would see these very short term gains. Um, and the the reality has been that those gains haven't been quite delivered upon. Um, and so now people are re-examining what automation means. Um, you know, knitting. Um, quite often, it's knitting together the fulfilment and the um, and the. Uh, the operations community and, yeah. and, the, and the assurance piece as well to get an end-to-end -end flow so that you're not kind of, you know, separating the two worlds, you're kind of trying to bring them together. So a lot of what Zero Touch is about is about, I suppose, normalising that whole piece between, you know, the network guy and the operations guy. Well, what they found as well, I believe, is that they need a new, whole new BSS, OSS uh, system to, to manage what they want to do because we've, I've been following NFV very closely since the very first white paper. And I know quite a lot about it, and I've spoken to a lot of people mm. about it. And there's a palpable sense of disappointment now that it's not going ahead as quickly as people thought it might be. Yeah, I think, again, it's about finding the right toolkit to solve the right problem. So, you know, everybody, um, you know, all the service providers that I talk to on a daily basis have brownfield, and you have to find a way to make the brownfield work with the, the new services that you want to. So I think the, you know, the idea that you're going to you know, discard OSS is probably mistaken but you have to knit it together um, in the right way to deliver the new services while maintaining what you you already have in place um, no one's going to going to reinvest um, in in rebuilding OSS but if you can take you know what's good and what is stable and what operates and then put the new services on top of that that's very valuable okay thank you um, the transformation of CSPs and telcos and the industry has been going on for several years mm. concurrently with this. And of course the vendor community, the whole point about one of the things about NFV, not the whole point, but mm. one of the major selling points, was that it gave control back to the operators. They weren't going to be locked into a mm. specific vendor indefinitely and they would determine what they wanted and the vendor community would provide it. Mm -hmm. Question is, is that what's actually happening? Is it? What's the best thing that the vendor community could do to help CSPs on this transformation journey other than trying by one means or another to lock them back in again? I think the best thing, uh, so I mean, I, I can speak more as an, an orchestration vendor, and the best thing that we can really do is to, is to listen to what the service providers want to do. So, you know, to, to understand, you know, where their problems are in their processes. And then once we've understood it, then provide practical solutions. So it's all well and good having an architecture that you like, but again, that architecture falls over the first time you look at you know, what's already there. Um, so you can't go in with, uh, with, with dogma, you have to go in with you know, pragmatism and listening and understanding and then kind of come back around and say, well, look, let's, let, let's, let's work with what you have, let's find a way to knit it together and let's find a way to bring you know, more value from what you've already got without having to, to rip it up and start again. Back to automation then, mm. Mark, for a minute. How would automation help CSPs provide their customers with the best possible quality of experience? And I, I think it's, it's a good question because I think inherent in, in that question is the belief that everything has to be the best possible. I think I'd take it another way. I'd say, how do you provide a good enough service for whatever the, the end customer needs? So um, if, I'm, um, if I'm browsing the web, um, if I open my smartphone, I browse the web, um, I don't need the best possible quality of service for that. What I need is something which is good enough that I get what I, what I want. But if I'm on a voice call, then I might want a different quality of service. So I think it's, it's matching the application to the network, um, which is going to be really key. And if you 
as a service provider can unlock that capability, then you, um, you start to provide a network which is properly flexible and you start to, you start to then have to explore that, that collapsing of the application layer down to the network layer and unifying it together. Um, we see a lot of work in, 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 in that kind of work. SD-WAN is a, a good example of you know, where, that, that, uh, where that concept is starting to be applied of you know, matching the application to the underlay, um, but it can, it can go a lot further. Let's just put something, if you put your Amdocs hat on figuratively mm. for a moment. Last year you worked with Orange and AT&T on what was called the Elastic Ethernet, mm -hmm. which always made me smile, uh, proof of concept. Yes. What's the latest on that? Again, what, you hit, one hears of these initiatives and then you don't hear about them again for a long time, or maybe not ever. <laughs> well, where, are you, where are you at with that? Have any real services emerged from the proof of concept? So we, um, immediately after the show, and we were very you know, successful there, we, um, we started to kind of, uh, you know, if you like, explore the ways that you could apply that as a, as a service. Um, and one of the things we got to was, um, you know, think about how it could apply to Internet of Things and thinking about how you would then sell that as a, as a service to an end customer. So you can imagine having a, a sensor array de um, deployed in the field. Um, and for most of the time, it's sending no traffic. Um, but when it sends traffic, it's going to send a big bulk of data and it'll send it for however long a period and then collapse back down again. So. One of the things we started to do was to talk about how do you how do you order that as a service? How do you sell that as a service to to an end customer? Um, and to think about sending something which maybe has a very low normal nominal capacity, but which can scale up quickly. Um, so we spent a lot of time working with the, the our two main partners on you know, figuring out how to um, how to encode that and how to make that orderable. And that is turning into work which is ongoing at, at, in MEF to actually build the standard interfaces to allow that ordering to happen. Um, in parallel as well, we, we worked with, um, with Orange quite extensively on building out the, the northbound service control APIs, which give you both the ability to order that service and then to adjust it in life. So we've spent um, a lot of time working with them, figuring out how to build it into ONAP, and um, there's going to be a first release in the Beijing release, which is May. Um, of this year, um, which will start to give uh, a first version of what the API is going to look like. Now, it's, it's not an end state, but it's something which is you know, good enough to get working with and to start you know, using in earnest. So what will happen now? You say it's good enough to get working with. So what's the next step? The, the next step is to, um, is, is to do some technical tweaks because it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing process. This is um, you know, both the upside and downside of the open source world is that you, know, you, you tend to have your drops in public and you, know, you, you tend cool. to have to align to those drops. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it's, it's a good enough interface to start ordering those services and to be, and to be usable um, in the field, um, but we will continue to refine it and refine you know, how the internal architecture maps onto the ONAP architecture. How about 5G? We'll move on, move on to that one next. I mean, again, we've watched this with great interest and mm. the usual sort of cynical amusement as a journalist <laughs> would have when, you, when the, the hype cycle is at its height. Yes. We saw it with NFE, we saw it with 3G, we saw it with 4G. Now it's 5G. Hopefully, reality is now intruding into the hype. <clears throat> we can see something of the shape things are going to be. How important will automation be, do you think, when it comes to, to preparing for proper in the street, in the air 5G. One of the big use cases I you know, keep hearing about, and I'm sure you know, the same as with you, is, is the concept of a, of a network slice and, yes, how you, and how you deliver that. And I think yeah. if you're going to properly deliver a network slice, you have, to have, you have to have automation in place. And that automation has to really understand the whole end-to-end -end service. Um, if you slice it into, into sub-components, um, you're only really going to be able to manage within that sub-component um, idea. And, 5G, given it has you know, no real edge except the device that it's being talked to. Right. If, you, if you slice it too, too, thin, too thinly, you may end up um, either not being able to give the full flexibility that people want to get to, yeah. um, or you may have to end up you know, duplicating too much data into those, into those areas. So I think automation, you know, th th there's, there's going to be some automation which is going to be needed at a, at a service level to understand the whole service, and then there's some which is going to be needed at each of the component layers. And I think one of the, the interesting things in the next couple of years is figuring out you know, where those boundary lines lie between, you know, for different service types. So I think that's, that's how I see kind of automation being, you know, being important in 5G.